Chapter 67, Fourth Year, February, Part 2 Remus almost missed what happened, because everyone in the crowd immediately stood up, jostling to see the disaster unfold. Fortunately, when Remus stood up, he was a good deal taller than those around him. Sirius tried. No one could deny that. The moment he saw the bludger hit Regulus, he bent flat on his broom and shot forward as if the devil was at his heels, faster than Remus had seen anyone, even James, fly. In fact, Sirius gathered such a speed, and at such a terrifying vertical angle, that Remus felt sure he was going to crash to the ground, and his stomach lurched with fear. Sirius was too late, but Madame Hooch was not. She stood on the grass, wand raised, and managed to slow Regulus's descent, so that his body appeared to be falling through water, not air. By the time Sirius hit the ground, dropping his broom and pelting towards his brother, Regulus was lying so peacefully he could have been sleeping. Sirius was on his knees. The rest of the team were landing around him. McGonagall was shouting something over the megaphone, and a crowd quickly surrounded the two black brothers, so that no one could see anything. Remus began to hobble down the wooden steps as quickly as his wonky hip would allow. Peter scurried along behind him. Where are you going? he panted. Sirius, was all Remus could think to say. But once they reached ground level, they couldn't get onto the pitch. The heads of houses were shepherding students back into the castle and wouldn't let them past. They'll have taken Regulus to the hospital wing, Peter said. Maybe Sirius is in the changing rooms. No, Remus shook his head. No, he'd want to go with Reg. He probably thinks it's all his fault. Well, Peter looked up at him. He did hit the bludger, didn't he? Remus clenched his fists and fought the urge to hit Peter. I'm going to the hospital wing then. He turned and began to stride awkwardly towards the castle, trying to get ahead of anyone else. What about James? Peter had to jog to keep up. He'll be there too, Remus replied. And of course he was. When Peter and Remus arrived outside the hospital wing, having battled their way through the throngs of gossiping students, they found James sitting on the floor outside, elbows resting on his knees, staring into space. He was still in his Quidditch robes, his cheeks were still flushed from flying, and his hair was a mess. Is he okay? Remus asked at once, and he wasn't sure who he meant. Yeah, I think so. James looked up at them in a dazed surprise. Knocked out cold, though. Pomfrey won't let me in. Serious? Yeah, he's in there. Thought I'd better wait. Slughorn's contacting their parents, so... He shrugged. Thought I'd better be here. We're all here, Remus said firmly, sitting down next to James with some difficulty. His hip was really sore now. The pain shot all the way down from the pelvis to the ankle. Peter eventually squatted down too, and they waited. Did you see what happened? James asked finally. I was on the other end of the pitch. I, I didn't... A bludger, Remus said. Mulsiba hit one right at Sirius. It had to be a foul. Sirius hit it back at him, but Mulsiba got out of the way, and Regulus was right behind him. Sirius can't have seen him. It was an accident. It was... It was horrible. Shit, James said. They were quiet for a bit longer. It was starting to grow dark, and the candles in the sconces along the wall opposite began to light themselves. Remus wondered what James and Peter were thinking. Were they more worried about Sirius than Regulus, like he was? He felt a bit guilty. But Madame Pomfrey had been putting him back together since he was eleven years old, and he didn't think that a bludger to the head was beyond her abilities. What concerned him more was the state Sirius would be in. He had thrown hexes at Regulus a hundred times, but he had never, ever hurt his little brother intentionally. This hadn't been intentional either but Remus knew in his gut that Sirius wouldn't see it that way. They were disturbed from their thoughts by the quick clacking of high heels on flagstones and Professor McGonagall's worried voice coming around the corner. Please, Walpurga, 
He couldn't be in safer hands with Madame Pomfrey. It's really best that he isn't moved. I think I shall be making the decisions here, Minerva. That cold, low voice replied. James and Peter leapt up nervously, and James bent to help Remus to his feet. None of them had seen Sirius's mother since that awful Christmas two years ago, and the terror of her was still fresh. McGonagall and Mrs Black came marching around the corner, while Perga in her thick black travelling cloak and sharp high-heeled boots. She had that same look of cruel superiority Remus remembered, but her forehead was creased too, and her hair wasn't as neat as usual. She was accompanied by a small elderly wizard with a long trailing beard carrying a heavy-looking dragonskin case. Walpurga glanced at the three boys waiting outside the hospital wing, and Remus held his breath. But she didn't seem to think it worth her time and strode past, pushing the wooden doors open with both hands and marching inside. Remus, James and Peter peered in from the hallway to watch the scene unfold. McGonagall and the bearded wizard hurried in after Mrs Black. Regulus was lying in a bed, and from what they could tell, was still unconscious, or maybe just sleeping. With his eyes closed, and at a distance, he looked remarkably like Sirius, which made Remus's stomach lurch again. But Sirius was sitting beside him, wide awake in his red Gryffindor robes, one foot propped up on a stool. He looked very pale, and much smaller than usual. His eyes were red. He seemed to shrink even further as his mother approached, swooping towards her son like some terrible vampire bat. Madame Pomfrey stepped in just then. He's quite all right, just a heavy knock, she said reassuringly. I've given him a healing draught and mended the fractures. Fractures? Walpurga said sharply. She stood at the end of Regulus's bed, looking down at him. She didn't try to reach out for him, or Sirius, but stood still as a statue. Very minor, and completely healed now, Madame Pomfrey said. He'll be up and about by tomorrow morning. Now, Sirius has... This is our family physician, Walpurga interrupted, extending a hand to introduce the wizened old man beside her. He will be taking care of my son. I am taking him home as soon as he has been thoroughly examined. I am telling you, everything that can be done has been done, Madame Pomfrey said, sounding rather angry now. Walpurga looked down at her imperiously. Within your competence, I am sure, but he is my son, and I will care for him as I see fit. Madame Pomfrey turned red in the face and appeared to be quite speechless. McGonagall had to lean over and whisper something in her ear to mollify her. The old bearded wizard placed his case on the bedside table and opened it, before silently bending over Regulus. Meanwhile, Walpurga had turned her attention to her elder son. She did not move from the end of the bed, but her hawkish glare was enough to hold Sirius in place. You, she said. What are you doing here? Sirius said something, but it came out barely above a whisper. Walpurga frowned. What? she barked. Speak up, boy! He's my brother, Sirius said, louder now, though his voice was hoarse and cracked slightly. Mrs Black tutted. For goodness sake, have you been crying? Try to show at least some modicum of decorum. Toujours pur, Sirius. Try to remember your duty. Sirius did not reply, but bowed his head, his hair falling in front of his face. Remus hoped for his sake that he hadn't begun to cry again. Walpurga continued. You may leave, Sirius. Your father and I will see you in June. With that, she turned back to Regulus and did not acknowledge Sirius again. James started forward, unable to watch any longer. But Remus held back with Peter. It didn't feel like his place, somehow. He didn't have the right. And though Remus wished more than anything he knew what to do, James was always so much better with Sirius. McGonagall had apparently seen James and acted quickly, placing a hand on Sirius's shoulder and gently guiding him out of his chair and towards the doorway. 
He was limping slightly. Madame Pomfrey joined them halfway and handed Sirius a draught too. Straight up to bed and drink every drop, you hear me? You shouldn't be in too much pain, but it'll be an uncomfortable night. Sirius nodded wearily, not speaking. James clapped him on the shoulder and squeezed, then nodded to McGonagall. She looked like she very much wanted to say something, but held her tongue, only glancing back at Regulus and Mrs Black. She would keep an eye on the situation, Remus was sure. She would let Sirius know if anything happened. The four marauders walked most of the way to Gryffindor Tower together in dead silence until they came to a dual staircase. And Peter suddenly said, We've missed dinner. James and Remus glared at him and he looked very hurt. What I meant, he squeaked angrily, was that I'll go down to the kitchens now and then get them to send something up, if that's okay with you two. Nice one, Pete, James said apologetically. Remus just ducked his head, looking away. Peter turned tail and headed downstairs, while the other three kept going upwards. It was slow progress, considering two of them had pronounced limps. Bright state we must look. Sirius muttered humorlessly as they paused on one of the landings for a breather. "'What's wrong with you, anyway?' Remus finally asked, rubbing his aching hip. "'Broke my ankle,' Sirius said. "'Landed too hard on it.' James winced. Sirius shrugged. "'Can't feel it. Just a bit wobbly.' When they finally reached their bedroom, Sirius locked himself inside the bathroom to shower and change. Peter shortly reappeared, laden with sandwiches, fruit, chocolate, cakes, and everything else he could carry. "'Punch of girls down there want to see Sirius,' he huffed, dumping everything onto his bed. "'There's a gang of second years all making him get well cards. Told them to bugger off.' "'Thanks, Pete,' James said. "'You're a good mate.' Peter smiled, finally. He nodded at the closed bathroom door. "'He okay?' He will be, James sighed, stripping off his Quidditch robes and leaving them in a pile on the floor. In just his vest and underwear, he grabbed a chicken sandwich from Pete's bed and bit into it hungrily. Remus and Pete took this as permission and followed suit. Sirius was in the bathroom for a long time, and they thought it best to leave him to it. James changed into his usual clothes and began tidying Sirius's eternally messy bed. Remus helped collecting up the scattered books and half-finished essays. He would finish them, Remus decided. He would do all of Sirius's homework for the entire week, if it helped at all. I fucking hate his family, James said suddenly, as he shook out one of Sirius's pillowcases. His mum's even worse than mine, Peter sniffed. Remus began to sort through Sirius's notes, smoothing out the parchments and trying to make sense of what was due when. The bathroom door clicked, and Sirius emerged in his pyjamas, his hair wet and combed back. "'You hungry, mate?' Peter asked nervously, offering a plate of sandwiches. Sirius shook his head and walked towards his bed. "'I'm just going to go to sleep,' he murmured, pulling the curtains across. "'Sirius?' Remus burst out before he completely disappeared from view. Sirius stopped, staring at him through the gap in the hanging. Remus chewed his lip. It wasn't your fault, he said. I was watching. It was an accident. You both were so focused on the game, that's all. Sirius looked at him, his face soft after the shower, his eyes tired and dark. He smiled gently and shrugged. Still did it then drew the curtains tight shut. The Quidditch game was declared incomplete, and both teams agreed to a rematch once the Slytherins had found another seeker. The next morning at breakfast, the Slytherin captain received a howler from Walpurga Black, accusing him of putting her son in danger. Regulus was not present, and rumours abounded, but McGonagall had privately told Sirius that all was well, Mrs. Black simply wished to keep Regulus at home for a further week as a precaution. Sirius carried on about his day, but the light in him had dimmed. He didn't hex anyone, make jokes, or even talk out of turn in his lessons. He simply pushed through 
as if sleepwalking. Remus was starting to wonder whether it was still the shock of the accident, or the anxiety of having to face his mother inside Hogwarts. That night was the full moon, so Remus could be of little help to Sirius. Actually, he was a little bit glad to have the excuse to get away from the dorm room, which had become a dismal, quiet place while Sirius was in his mood. Remus wasn't the only one. Peter kept slipping away to visit Desdemona. Perhaps it was all of the quiet, all of the unsaid things, and unresolved tension. But February's moon was a bad one. Remus awoke with his throat burnt raw from howling, splinters under his fingernails and bruises all over. Lately he'd noticed that the older he got, the more he was able to remember after the transformations. It still wasn't very clear, like remembering a dream, images and feelings swimming in and out of sight. But this time, Remus thought that maybe the wolf had wanted something. Maybe it had wanted to get out more than usual. He lay in the hospital bed, trying to remember, feverish and headachy, too uncomfortable to sleep, sheets twisted around his ankles like manacles. Morning, Mooney. A soft, sad voice spoke to him. He had to rub his eyes and blink a few times before he even realised it was serious. Uh, morning, he slurred, groggy from whatever painkiller he'd been supplied. It always made his accent slip, which he hated. What you doing here? Sirius sat on the end of the bed and stuck out his foot. Check up on my ankle. It's fine now. Oh, good. Remus nodded, trying to pull himself into a sitting position and failing miserably. How was it? Sirius asked, gesturing broadly at Remus's body. Fine. Normal. James here too. Nah. Sirius looked down at his shoe. Giving him a break from me. I don't think he minds. I do, though. Remus nodded. He didn't like being fussed over either. Mooney? Yeah? You know how you said it wasn't my fault? It wasn't your fault, Remus said firmly. A little bit too firmly. He felt the muscles in his throat strain and contract, and he began to cough. Sirius hopped off the bed and grabbed the glass of water from the nightstand, handing it to Remus. Remus gulped it down, embarrassed, spilling a bit down his front. I didn't hit him on purpose, you're right, Sirius said, looking out of the window, over Remus's head, squinting slightly as if he was looking for something out there. But when I saw him falling like that, I thought, I thought, don't let him die. Well, of course, Remus frowned. He wished Sirius would meet his eye. He's your brother. Of course you don't want him to. I wasn't thinking about him, though, Sirius said. I was thinking about me. I was thinking, if he dies, then I'll be the only one left and my parents will... I wouldn't have any way out. I need Regulus to stay alive. I need him to be the perfect son so that it doesn't matter if I'm the bad son. That's what I was thinking. I'm a coward. Remus didn't know what to say, but he had to say something. You'd still have been sorry if he died, though. Not just because of that. Yeah, but my first thought... People don't think properly when they're scared. Believe me. Remus said, hoping he sounded authoritative. I saw you. You risked your life to try and save him. That's not cowardly. Broke your stupid ankle. Like the idiotic, hard-headed Gryffindor you are. Sirius exhaled, a strained little laugh. He looked at his feet again, then at Remus. Remus smiled at him encouragingly, even though his jaw ached. Reg gonna be okay? Yeah, fine. Owled me this morning. Being waited on hand and foot, it sounds like. Mother tried to get me kicked off the team too, but he stopped her. There you go then, Remus smirked. You're still the bad son. Sirius laughed. Chapter 68, Fourth Year, March Saturday the 8th of March, 1975 Considering the events of the spring term, Remus was not expecting much of a celebration at his 15th birthday. Of course, 
The marauders were pleased as ever to prove him wrong. As usual, everything was planned with extreme secrecy, and Remus was completely unaware until the very last moment. It was the Saturday before his birthday, and he had been lounging on his bed reading, with one of Sirius's records playing low in the background. He often borrowed the record player and camped out in his bed these days. Sirius never seemed to mind. It was only about nine o'clock, but he was alone and considered an early night. Just as he made his mind up to get into his pyjamas, Sirius burst into the room with a wicked grin on his face that could only mean one thing. It was going to be a long night. Ready? he said, bounding across the floor, bringing in the smell of wood smoke from the common room fireplace. For what? Remus asked calmly, marking his place and setting his book aside. For your birthday surprise, obviously, Sirius sighed, as if Remus was being very slow. Come on, up you get. Shoes on, please. Wear those mad muggle boots you've got, with the crazy laces. Uh, where are we going? Out. Sirius began digging around in his trunk. He withdrew a pair of muggle jeans and a plain black t-shirt. Oh, you mean out-out? Remus raised an eyebrow as Sirius began to undress. Yeah, take your cloak. Sirius looked good in muggle clothes, Remus thought to himself. Really, most people looked better in a t-shirt and jeans than they did in a school uniform or 17th century robes. But Sirius wore everything well. Rumors asked no further questions as he laced up his boots. It was clear that Sirius was enjoying the surprise, and he saw no reason to spoil it. He was led down the stairs, feeling very odd in jeans and a traveling cloak, but not complaining. Sirius probably thought they looked like the height of muggle fashion. In the common room, they were met by James and Peter, also grinning mischievously. You know my birthday isn't for two days yet. Remus said, a small smile of his own playing on his lips. Tonight's events are time-sensitive, Sirius replied briskly. He was trying to retain an aloof air of mystery, but was clearly bursting to tell Remus everything. And don't worry, James said, eyes twinkling as he held back the portrait door to exit the common room. We won't forget to sing for you on Monday at breakfast. And lunch, Peter added. And dinner, Sirius finished. Now they were winding their way down the Gryffindor Tower staircase. Under you go, lads, James said, throwing the heavy invisibility cloak over all four of them. As long as they all stayed very close together, and Remus hunched over, they just about fit. It wouldn't stand another growth spurt from any of them, though. Fortunately, they didn't have to shuffle too far, as Remus expected, they headed for the statue of the humpbacked witch and slipped behind it into the tunnel which led to Honeydukes. So, fifteen, Sirius said cheerily as they walked, clapping Remus on the shoulder in what he must have considered a very manly sort of way. Excited? Remus shrugged. Never really thought about it. You tell me, you're the oldest. Well, obviously I'm much wiser and much more mature than the rest of you. James snorted, walking ahead with his wand lit. Sirius ignored him. I'd rather be seventeen, though. Then we could apparate, at least. Oh, don't start, Peter huffed, bringing up the rear. He actually wanted to try and learn to apparate, Remus. Just for your birthday, so we could get into Hogsmeade easier. Can't apparate inside Hogwarts. Remus said. Ten points to Mooney, Sirius grinned. We could have apparated out of the cellar, though, save us having to try and get past old Honeyduke. Apparition is really hard, though, isn't it? Remus asked. He secretly wasn't sure if he'd be able to do it at all. Even doing side-along with Mr. Potter that once had been really exhausting and made him feel sick. Yeah, but we could do it, Sirius replied confidently. It was a bit much on top of everything else we've had to do this term, though, Peter said. Sirius gave the smaller boy a very annoyed look, and Peter's mouth dropped open, as if he'd said something very wrong. You mean, with exams coming up, 
Remus asked innocently, to save Peter. He was amazed Pettigrew had managed to keep it quiet for so long, though it wasn't as if James and Sirius were half as discreet as they thought they were. Yeah, exactly. Peter sounded relieved. Exams! I'm definitely going to fail History of Magic this year. Definitely. I'll never get an owl in it. They'd talked about next year's owls for a bit longer, bemoaning their own unpreparedness in this subject or that, though Remus was actually quite looking forward to them, especially the practical exams. Finally, they reached Honeyduke's cellar, and this was where their plan somewhat fell apart. Bugger, James said as he tried the locked door. He's usually still up doing his accounts or whatever. Must have gone to bed early. Or he could be out, Remus suggested. It's a Saturday night. What are we going to do? Peter asked. Elohomora? Oh, but we can't do magic. Let me see. Remus stepped forward, fiddling in his back pocket for the hairpin he'd had since summer. Easy, he said, inspecting the lock. He bent over it and inserted the pin, stroking it slowly upwards and listening carefully. The satisfying click told him it had worked. Then he stepped back, opening the door with a flourish. Ta-da! You beauty, James cheered. Come on, let's go. Once inside the shop, it was even easier, as that locked work from the inside. Then, all of a sudden, they were outside on the Hogsmeade High Street in the cold night air. It was deliciously thrilling, being somewhere they shouldn't. Remus didn't even care if they got away with it or not. He followed Sirius and James up the cobbled street, past the three broomsticks, the closed shops and the post office. The two excitable boys stopped abruptly outside another pub, one Remus hadn't been to before. The sign swinging above the entrance said, The Hog's Head, with an appropriately gory image beneath. There was an A-frame chalkboard on the pavement outside which read, Live music tonight, open mic, muggle tribute acts. Oh my god, Remus exclaimed. This was absolutely the last thing he'd expected. Now he knew why Sirius was grinning so broadly his cheeks must hurt. What do you think? The dark-haired boy asked eagerly. Sirius promised us you'd love it, James said, sounding less sure. Remus just stared at the chalkboard, then at Sirius. I love it, he confirmed. Inside, it was neither very busy nor too quiet, and looked as though the first act was just setting up. It wasn't as nice as the three broomsticks. There was straw on the floor rather than a carpet, and it smelt faintly of a farmyard. But Remus could see that they definitely weren't going to bump into anyone they knew, and no one was going to grass on them to the school. I'll get the first round in, Sirius said merrily, mischief still twinkling in his eyes. Sirius? James said sternly. Butterbeers, yeah? Hmm? So, Remus said as they settled themselves around a small rickety table which was close enough to the band, but also in a gloomy corner just in case. Muggle tribute acts? Is that a normal thing for wizards to listen to? Nah. James shook his head, looking just as baffled. There's been a bit of a trend for it lately, defying the Dark Lord and all his pure blood shite, that sort of thing. Are they going to play David Bowie? Peter asked. Poor Peter had the impression that muggle music began and ended with David Bowie, thanks to Sirius and Remus. The band announced themselves as Banshee Blues, just as Sirius returned with a tray of drinks, about 15 of them. Sirius? James raised his eyebrows. What? Sirius winked at him. I got you your butter beer. I meant just butter beer for all of us. How did you even get served? Is that fire whiskey? And mead? Sirius nodded. Don't drink any of it if you don't want. Here. He picked up a glass with about two inches of golden brown coloured liquid in it, raising it. To our beloved Mooney. Inventor of the Marauder's Map, architect of our greatest plans, completer of our overdue homework. To Mooney, 
The other two smirked. Remus looked at the band, too embarrassed to respond. He had never seen live music performed before, let alone live music performed by wizards. Their clothes were predictably odd, a mix of traditional robes and assorted muggle garments. The lead singer wore a white Stetson for some reason, paired with a pink feather boa. The instruments looked mugglish enough, but they had no amplifiers. Apparently magic took care of the volume. They played a few Beatles songs, then some Rolling Stones, and Remus thought they were pretty good. Even James was tapping his foot along by the end, though that might have been due to Sirius sneaking measures of fire whiskey into his butter beer. Fire whiskey was pretty foul, Remus thought, but no worse than the cheap vodka he'd been knocking back last summer. He proudly swallowed his first glass in one, without wincing, and Sirius stared at him in awe. Peter stuck to mead and kept asking, Am I drunk yet? Am I drunk? After every sip. After two flagons, he probably was. Maybe we should stick to butterbeer now, Remus said, eyeing Peter with concern. He was swaying on his stool slightly, pink-cheeked and grinning. Banshee Blues were packing away their instruments, and a pale-faced young woman with the drippy fringe approached the mic stand. That you, Lupin? A young wizard approached them from the bar. Remus vaguely recognised him, but wasn't sure where from. Uh, hi, he said nervously. Arnold Doyle. I was at Hogwarts last year, remember? He was tall and lanky, but so were half of the boys at school. Your fags got me through my newts. Oh. Right, yeah, hi Arnold, sorry. He still wasn't sure he remembered him, but the whiskey had made him feel friendly and warm towards everyone. What are you doing here? Girlfriend's playing. He nodded up at the stage, where the drippy-looking girl was tuning her acoustic guitar. What about you? I thought you were still at school. It's my birthday, Remus grinned. Snuck out, innit? Arnold laughed. Gotcha. Well, I won't dob you in. Can I buy you a drink? Say thanks for the cigs. You're our kind of man, Arnold, Sirius called out more loudly than he needed to in such a small pub, but he'd been matching Remus drink for drink. Arnold just laughed and went back to the bar. His girlfriend started playing, a Bob Dylan song, it sounded like, but Remus wasn't that familiar with folk. He still couldn't remember having sold Arnold anything, but Arnold clearly felt a debt was owed because he brought Remus an entire bottle of fire whiskey and set it down on the table. Happy birthday. Come of age, have you? Actually, Peter started, then stopped as Sirius kicked him hard under the table. Yeah, Remus replied smoothly. Cheers. After that, things went a bit wobbly, but he definitely decided smoking was a good idea, and Sirius, keen not to be outdone, agreed. Those things stink, Mooney, James complained, pulling a face. And what does he mean your fags got him through his newts? He must have confused me with someone, Remus shrugged. Cyrus burst into hysterical giggling. The next band, in Remus's opinion, was the best. They were called Dragonhide and played a lot of Slade, Status Quo and Black Sabbath. It made Remus want to get up and dance but he wasn't as drunk as Sirius or Peter, and had not completely lost his inhibitions. He couldn't help singing along towards the end, though, as almost everyone in the pub was at this point. It seemed somehow like such a good idea to get up on his chair, waving his glass above his head, as the whole pub roared. Sirius, of course, thought this was great fun, and after two attempts to climb up into his own stool, quickly caught by James, who was in better control of his faculties, ended up with his arms slung around Peter and James, swinging this way and that, singing at the top of his voice. In fact, the marauders were all so taken by this hook that they were all singing it as loudly as they could as they staggered back through Hogsmeade into the high street, 
arm in arm, tripping and laughing as they went. Out in the cold air, Remus felt a little bit sharper and slightly guilty as he realised what a state Sirius and Peter were in. By the time they got to Honeydukes, it must have been well past midnight. They snuck inside as quietly as possible and headed for the cellar, James and Remus desperately trying to herd Sirius and Peter away from all of the sweets on display. The walk back through the tunnel to Hogwarts was pretty dreadful. Peter could barely keep his eyes open and staggered against James, complaining he had a headache. Sirius bounced from wall to wall, seemingly only held upright by his own forward momentum, occasionally busting into snatches of song. At the end of the tunnel, James and Remus were very much sober. Peter was barely conscious, and Sirius looking worryingly green. Merlin, how are we going to get them back to bed without waking up the whole castle? James huffed, still supporting Peter. Sirius promptly leaned over and threw up. Christ. Remus grabbed his shoulders as he was in danger of toppling forward into the pool of sick. He pulled Sirius's hair back quickly and patted his friend on the back. Uh, he looked at James. Why don't you take Peter back with the cloak? It'll be easier. I'll wait a bit with him. He jerked his head at Sirius. Then summon the cloak in half an hour or so. Easier with two, anyway. Good plan, James said gratefully. You sure you don't want me to watch him? Sirius sat down on the ground very suddenly, head in his hands and groaning. Nah, I've looked after pissheads before, Remus smirked. You go. Cheers for the birthday, James. It was bloody brilliant. James flashed him a smile before disappearing under the invisibility cloak with Peter still clinging on for dear life. Remus sighed and sat himself down next to Sirius. He pointed his wand at the mess opposite. Scorify. And it was clean. Sirius groaned again and rested his head on Remus's shoulder. Remus chuckled softly. All right there, mate. Ugh. Yeah, sounds about right. Hey, don't puke on me, okay? Mmm. Thirsty? Yeah. Remus drank the last of his bottle of fire whiskey, then touched his wand to the opening. Aguamenti. And it filled with crystal clear cold water. He handed it to Sirius. Don't drink it too fast, or you'll puke. Hmm. Sirius sipped it a bit, eyes still closed. His face was a bit pale and clammy, but he still looked ten times better than Remus probably did. You're so good at this stuff, Mooney. He slurred, leaning heavily on Remus's shoulder. Yeah, Remus grunted, picking locks and holding a drink. And magic, Sirius murmured sleepily. Yeah, we're wizards, idiot. I'm good at magic, Sirius sighed. But you, like, are magic, you know? You're drunk and talking bollocks, Remus laughed. Oi, don't fall asleep. I've got to get you back. Shut up, Sirius replied, nodding off. Remus sighed and wondered if anyone would notice if they just stayed put. End of chapter 68